and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. I'm your weekly host, Scott Miller, 25-year associate inside the Franklin Covey Company. And each week, we like to bring to you another point of view on the topic of leadership, something Franklin Covey is well known after our four decades as an international leader in organizational development and performance improvement. And then occasionally, we like to twist things up. Most of you know by now that I sometimes suffer through the joy that is parenthood. Stephanie and I are parents to three young boys that are six, eight, and 10. And to my wife's horror, all of them got my own personality and energy level. Perhaps someday that will serve them well, but in the meantime, it's creating total pandemonium in the Miller house. Now, you probably also know that by watching this weekly, our three boys uh, and I go to Barnes & Noble every Saturday, at least when it's open during the pandemic. And they get to pick out a book or two because we're voracious readers in the Miller household. And a few weeks ago, I stumbled on the book, Ready or Not, Parenting Our Kids to Thrive in an Uncertain and Rapidly Changing World. And of course, as a struggling parent and leader, I snatched it up, devoured it over the last couple of weeks, and to my delight, Dr. Madeline Levine has agreed to join us today to talk all things parenting, which we know actually has some transfer over into our leadership roles in the workplace. Dr. Levine, welcome to On Leadership. Thank you, Scott. Pleasure to be here. It's a delight to have you here. You have been quarantining uh, in your apartment in San Francisco. It's a delight to have you take some time out to speak to our global leadership audience, because at this point, you know, six months plus into the pandemic, anybody who's a parent is desperate for any morsel you want to give us. And my sense is a lot of the same principles that governing parenting, that govern parenting, are very useful in the workplace as well. I was riveted reading your book. I have so many questions to ask. I also loved your interview on CBS this morning with Gail King. You crushed that interview. Congratulations, Dr. <laughs> Levine. What I'd like you to do, before we get into the book and some of your parenting advice, I would like for you to take a few moments and if you will reintroduce yourself to our listeners and viewers, talk a bit about your credentials, some of the books that you've written that are New York Times bestsellers as well, and then maybe talk about what was the stimulus for you writing your current book, Ready or Not. Thank you so much. And by the way, if your kids end up with your personality, they're destined to be successful, obviously. Where is so. my wife? Where, why can't my <laughs> wife hear this from a psych psychologist? <laughs> um, okay, so um, I started out, I come from a very working class background. I unfortunately lost my dad very young. Uh, we were on um, assistance. Uh, so I come from a, uh, a little bit of a tough background and Jewish education was incredibly important. I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo. I became a teacher, um, which I was for several years in the South Bronx of New York. They made a movie called Fort Apache, the Bronx yes. out of the area that I was teaching in. It was the hardest job I ever had, but I was terrible at it. And that is not false modesty. Um, I couldn't control a classroom. But what I could do was go home with a kid and sit with their mom at a kitchen table um, and talk about the possibility of getting the child out of what was a really damaging community environment. So I, I sort of learned that my talent wasn't in teaching or discipline, unfortunately, um, when I became a parent, but it definitely was in talking through things. And so from there, I worked in psychiatry in some low position um, until I was fired by my boss because she said, there is no way you're going to stay being a recreational therapist, which is what I was. You have to go back to school. And I was absolutely panicked. Um, I had no money. How was I going to pay my rent? But she was absolutely right. And I went back to graduate school. I got a PhD. Um, it was the best thing I ever did. But I had a mentor who believed in me. And it's part of why one of the chapters in Ready or Not is about the squiggly line. Um, in interviewing successful people around the country, very few of them went straight from college to what they were going to do for the rest of their life. There were two things. People did what they loved, who were successful, and they didn't do it for money. 
So I got interested in this idea of what percentage of people actually follow the straight line that was being um, put forth by parents and schools and teachers, like get good grades and go to the best college and that's how you're successful. It wasn't my experience at all in my own life. And then when I was interviewing people, it wasn't the experience of most of the people that I met. Um, I decided to write the book for a very specific reason. Um, I had co-founded an organization at Stanford called Challenge Success, which was a school reform project. I thought that this tremendous emphasis on grades and, and college acceptances and SAT scores, that was going on at the same time that kids were becoming more depressed, they were cutting themselves more, they were substance abusing more. It didn't seem like a good trajectory. Um, and so the organization is now around the country. And there are many people like me at this point who go around the country talking about that kids need to learn to collaborate and they need socio emotional skills and that our um, basically our way of looking at education was a very outdated model. And while I think I spoke at 400 schools when I wrote um, The Price of Privilege, which was the first book I wrote. And I had individual people changing, but there was no cultural shift. And the last book I wrote, which is called Teach Your Children Well, um, what I found was not only were things not getting better, they were actually getting worse. And, you know, in terms of leadership, issues, it was a really interesting moment for me because I had devoted my life to something and it would have been, I think, really easy to pretend everything was well and continue my organization and my work. But I was really interested. And by the way, I think curiosity is the most important thing you can cultivate in a child. Um, I was really curious about why it wasn't working, even though it meant that I had to take a really deep look at what I had done and what my colleagues around the country were doing. And it was out of that that I decided maybe I was talking to the wrong people. Uh, my whole life is about psychology and education. Um, and I felt that wasn't quite getting me where I wanted to go. It was like, how do you make cultural change? Who is it that's best positioned to talk about actual change? And so I ended up going to corporate America and to science, um, uh, yeah, corporate America and science and the military. Those are three areas that deal with change on a rapid scale. Um, and I found that for this book, which was trying to answer, you know, what the hell? How, I mean, you've got people talking to you all the time about how it's not a good idea to be so focused on on grades because that's not what many organizations are looking for anymore. And so I tapped into the experience of the military and corporate and science in terms of how do you handle change? And that, that's, that's ready or not. Dr. And Lenine. by the way, Scott, it was, I wrote it before the pandemic, obviously, right. and it came out the week before lockdown yeah. uh, here in, <laughs> in California. And, you know, it's like people ask me, how did I know there was going to be a pandemic? Well, obviously I didn't, but it was clear that things were changing very rapidly and kids were being ill prepared for that change. Now we have it in spades. So the good news is the doctor is in. So I might ask you some personal questions about my own parenting style. I can assure you <laughs> I will. Right ahead. Before we go there, I learned a lot in this book about the pervasiveness, uh, pervasiveness of anxiety both with parents and children, and the connection between epigenetics. Would you reorient our listeners to the research around anxiety and how it's becoming such a significant issue in families worldwide? Right, and, and you know, it's talked about a lot in terms of kids. So when I wrote my first couple of books, the rate of anxiety was about 20% in kids. The rate of anxiety now, depending whose statistics you look at, is about 30%, one in three um, kids, but also one in three of their parents are suffering from an anxiety disorder. And I don't mean just anxious. Look, we're in the middle of a, a 
I, I don't even know what word to use, a pandemic, a social meltdown, Black Lives Matter, um, a, a dysfunctional White House from my point of view, and the country is in tremendous turmoil. So are we all gonna be anxious? Absolutely, and appropriately so. But, but this is before the pandemic struck, we're starting to see these rates of anxiety just going up and up. Now, what we know is, you know, you use the word epigenetics. So what is epigenetics? Epigenetics is the idea that all of us have all different possibilities, genetic possibilities. Some of them are immutable. My eye color is not gonna change. Your height is not gonna change, but some of them are mutable. Some of them are changeable. And anxiety is one of those things. And so scientists like the expression, um, genetics loads the gun and environment pulls the trigger. And that's what epigenetics is. It's the intersection of your genetic propensity and the environment that you're in. So in terms of anxiety, we can't see a 50% increase in anxiety, say over 20 years, a 50% increase in self-mutilation over five years. We, we assume that that's not a genetic transformation in that very short period of time. So then what you need to do is say, okay, the genetics are probably more or less the same. What's going on in environment? It's environment that pulls the trigger. And so I took a deep look at what in the environment was making anxiety so much more prevalent. And those are things like um, a, a, relentless, um, a relentless focus on performance as opposed to process. Um, and it was the idea that the, the straight path was the path to be taken when in fact, I always ask my audience this question. So my audiences tend to be big, so maybe 500 people. And I'll say, how many of you took a straight line? Because there are always people who take a straight line. My brother wanted to be a veterinarian when he was four and he's 60 something now and he's a veterinarian. So there's always some people who know exactly what they wanna do. But the reality is I've asked that question to 100,000 people and the percentage of people who took a straight line is always somewhere between one and 10%, which means that the rest of us 90 to 99% took what I'm calling the squiggly path, just like I did, teacher first, right. um, then a psychologist. Now I do a lot of work with uh, very large corporations and businesses. So I, I think that's the way to go, but you need an environment that's not triggering anxiety for that. And I think all the uh, attention to outward markers of success, whether it's money or grades or college acceptances, was part of the environment, both for parents and for kids, that, that facilitated higher levels of anxiety. And, and being out of step, you and I talked a little bit earlier about, um, I'm sorry if I'm jumping your question no, about great. raising kids versus raising adults. Yes. Um, which do you want to raise? You definitely want to raise kids because the, as opposed to adults, because development follows a trajectory. And if you don't have the developmental structure in place for a child, they're not going to be a successful adult. You can't jump from laying in the crib to running a marathon. You can't teach a nine-year-old calculus because cognitively, they're not able to think abstractly. So we want to be where our kids are in the process, and we want to create an environment that doesn't um, goose the potential to be anxious. Dr. Levine, as a parent of three boys, I read a lot of parenting books because my wife tells me to. <laughs> and, <laughs> And um, one of the things that I took away from a famous parenting book a couple of years ago was that there is often too much focus on trying to make our children into adults, that we often fall into the trap of encouraging them to make adult decisions early on and take responsibility for their actions when it's maybe too premature. 
Uh, again, it's good to take responsibility for your actions. What advice would you give parents that are in that sort of um, squiggly area of how much do I decide for my p child versus how much do I allow them to decide for themselves? It goes back to that comment of a friend of mine that owns a Montessori school. She once said to me, to quote you, you know, I'm raising adults, not, I'm not raising children. And I didn't necessarily, I, I don't know if I agree or disagreed. Um, where is the line between empowerment and letting it kind of naturally come about? So um, I, I said to you before, you can't raise successful adults if you haven't raised successful children, period. Because the kinds of skills that adults need, uh, the ability to read a room, the ability to talk with other people, the ability to collaborate, the ability to fail and stand up again. Those are all things that are taught in childhood. Um, let me think of an, an example would be uh, if you watch kids play tag in a playground, it looks like nothing's happening, right? They're just running around. But the game of tag is incredibly instructive for kids because there's a leader, there's a follower. You need to agree on who those people are. If the leader stops or the follower stops, there is no game. There's an entire skill set in what looks like child's play. And I would argue that kids absolutely need those experiences in order to learn the skills that I think are most critical for successful adulthood, which would be things like socio-emotional skills, but also self-regulation. Um, I have a story I like, which is um, I had a patient who didn't like sauce. And so her mother accommodated her, and I'll talk about accommodation in a minute, but her mother accommodated her by never putting any sauce on her food. And when she got invited to a sleepover or for dinner at somebody's house, um, the mom would call up and say, my daughter doesn't like sauce, please don't put sauce on her food. And this was just this ongoing phobia. And um, one day she, the, this girl is out in the playground and one of the kids hears that she doesn't like sauce. And the kid goes up to her and says, you know, that's just so stupid. She stopped because the peer group, the peer pressure, the desire to be part of that playground group was far stronger than um, the mother who was trying to accommodate. So I think kids need those kinds of experiences. Um, the issue of when you let a kid, choosing is really good. So we start that young, right? You and I both have three boys. You wanna play lacrosse or soccer. Um, do you wanna wear your shorts or your uh, sweats today. My kids are all grown up. And those kinds of increasing options for choice are very important because they cultivate a sense of mastery and self-efficacy. And I think the question becomes, which you just asked, how do you know when to allow your child more choices? And that's tough because we get anxious. I just finished talking about how our own level of anxiety is high. So I remember when your kids are still too young, Scott, but when, well, you know where, bike riding is a good example. I was gonna use driving a car, but let's use bike riding. So kids like to ride bikes. Um, how do you know when they get to choose to go around the neighborhood? Well, you do that by looking at how they perform prior to that. So the first time they take a bike out, right, they're allowed to go down the block and you keep an eye on them. And if they master that, they're allowed to go down the block and you don't keep an eye on them. And if they master that, master meaning they're able to do it, they're not anxious, they know how to stop it, they know how to change a tire. If they do that, then you're ready to say, well, do you want to be on the block? You want to go around the corner? They go around the corner, they do that successfully, they come home on time, they don't have a problem, then you're ready to let them go in a two block radius or a three block radius. You decide what a child can choose by seeing how close they are to having mastered the previous step. Um, and I think that's a good rule of thumb and you're gonna have a good, remember this because when your kids start driving, um, which is parenting hell, um, maybe particularly with boys, maybe not, 
you know, how do you know when they can, I'm um, in San Francisco, cross the bridge, go to Tahoe? It's incremental. And you sort of keep your eye on how they do. You never say um, you're in Utah, you know, you never say, oh yeah, sure, drive over to Montana, whatever, uh, until they've mastered a whole bunch of things before that. I had so no anxiety kind of coming into this interview. Now you have uh, exponentially raised my anxiety. Uh, doctor, answer this for me. I, I think I face a very similar challenge that many parents do. And that was, you know, I was raised in the 70s. I'm 52, born in 68. Uh, from a, a you know, middle class family, we had very little of what we wanted. It had everything what we needed. And now mm -hmm. as I have gained more success with my wife and more financial stability, there is that desire to provide our children with the things that we didn't have, whether it be clothes or bikes or iPads or vacations or books or you name it. As I look right. back onto my own childhood, I realize later in life, because my parents didn't, didn't mean they couldn't. They just chose not to buy this right. or accommodate that. You talk in your book a lot about relentless accommodation. What is the sweet spot of you know, wanting your children to have and have access to more, but not creating such an environment where they're pampered and they're not building the skills to get a job and to solve problems. Uh, the doctor is in, fix me. <laughs> um, so I, I wanna clarify this idea about ruthless accommodation or what in the book I think I call accumulated disability. And I, I want to be clear about what that means, because I think it's antithetical to raising a, a healthy kid. And by the way, you know, what you were pointing to was you don't want a spoiled, entitled kid. Nobody wants a spoiled, entitled kid. So there are things that um, contribute to that. And there are things that contribute to kids who are kind and generous and feel that they have a sense of purpose. But I want to go back for a minute to accommodation, because I think that's at the heart of these rising rates of anxiety. Um, because we're all so anxious, we're working very hard to uh, attenuate, to lessen the degree of anxiety that we feel. So I'll give you an example. A child walks past a barking dog. These are just very everyday examples. Walks past a barking dog and is frightened by it runs home um, and says to mom, I'm not walking to school anymore. I'm afraid of the dog. He barked at me. Now you have two options there. The option that gets taken too often is, oh, honey, I don't want you to be scared. Mom will drive you to school. Or why don't we walk around the block the other way and that way you don't have to face the dog. That's what I'm calling accommodation to anxiety. You, you, you keep doing that with a child. One, it tells the child that they're not capable of tolerating a barking dog. It's the antithesis of what a psychologist would do. We would do something called progressive desensitization, which would mean small exposures to think about a dog, look at a picture of a dog, uh, hear a dog bark, and then walk by the dog with somebody, then walk by the dog without somebody. And th this may be unpopular. Um, it's exactly why I don't like trigger warnings or safe spaces in schools. It's antithetical to what we know about overcoming phobia and trauma, which is small exposure, not running away from the thing that's anxiety provoking. So I think because, look, Parent, you know, I was a working mom, my husband's a surgeon. Um, it was often easier just to make it easier for my kids. Um, and I think every time I did that in the short run, you know, we're talking long game and short game. Yeah. So in the short game, it took care of everybody's anxiety. In the long run, it just made us more anxious. And, I, and I've come to this idea about a brave family particularly now in the middle of a pandemic, that one of the things you want to communicate to your kid um, is that this will end and that you're a brave family and it's difficult. And we'll talk in a few minutes, I, I would imagine, about the pandemic. But instead of constant accommodation, because if you're always accommodating, you set your kid up for failure. 
I'm going to give you one other short story. And that was about um, a, a young boy. I saw him over many years. He couldn't sleep alone. And full disclosure, one of my kids came up to my room probably till he was seven and slept on the floor. So there isn't any one thing that's going to ruin your child, but, but there are better and worse ways to do things. And this kid wouldn't sleep alone. His parents accommodated that till he was about 11. Then he started getting invitations to sleepovers. He'd go, the parents would get a call in the middle of the night. He's not sleeping, come get him, they would. Uh, he went to sleepaway camp, got a call, come get him. He's not doing well, they did. And finally, this kid goes to college and he can't sleep and he has to come home. He doesn't like the roommate, there's a mouse in the room, he, but he hasn't develop the muscle um, of tolerating discomfort. And that's life. Life is challenging. Um, and like anything else, you need practice to be good at something. And one of the things I think very strongly we, we need to um, allow for our children is the experience of overcoming anxiety. Now, I'm not saying if your child's out of their mind and terrified, you go, well, good luck. That, that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, but I am saying that the small dosing of anxiety is what allows us to be adults. The, the last talk I gave, and then I'll be quiet, the last talk I gave in San Francisco was about 500 people. And for whatever reason, I asked how many people in the audience had never had their heart broken and one person raised their hand. So 499 or so of the rest of us, including me, had had our heart broken at some point in our lives. And I was thinking about, well, they were all sitting there, you know, they, they weren't so impaired that they couldn't make it to parent night at the, at the local private school. So how is it that we learned break, having a broken heart's really hard? It's because we've allowed some disappointment in other times, you know, like my parents never would have made a big deal out of my not being invited to a party or my not being asked by the boy I liked in high school to the prom. They let me sit with those disappointments. And that was why I was able to tolerate real disappointment, which we're all going to have in life. There's divorce, there's death, there's illness, there's pandemics, there's financial ruin, there's all kinds of disappointments we need to have some skills for tolerating them. Well, to that point, I read an article you wrote recently where you talked about a parent whose daughter, for whatever reason, wasn't invited to kind of like the party at school. And so they actually threw a bigger, better party. Walk us through that, because I think every parent is going to face that at some point, whether they have boys or girls. Right. So don't do that, please. So I had one, one uh, family where the mom did a spa party and another family with a boy in a similar situation. This was three years ago. And they took the group of boys to a Warriors game, which is pretty hot. Steph Curry out here at the time. Um, don't do that because it says a whole bunch of things. One, it tells your child that there will always be somebody to catch them, which is, you know, and go back to the kid who's being told in the schoolyard, it's stupid that you don't like sauce. There will not always be somebody to catch your child when they're disappointed in something. It gives the message that the child is so impaired that they can't tolerate being uh, uh, not invited. It hurts not to be invited middle school to the popular kids party. I think you need to give the message. Um, you can do that. You know what I don't hear from parents, Scott, is um, phrases like, you've got this, honey, or you can do this, or I know you can do this, or, you know, the phrases that fall on the side of having confidence in your child's ability to withstand some disappointment. Dr. Levine, my previous question I want to delve into is how do parents know when we're raising spoiled children and we're also, the other side, allowing our children perhaps a step up because of our hard work? When do we know when we're overindulging our children? Um, I have two responses to that, Scott. One, I think nobody knows you and your children, your children better than you and your wife, nobody. So, you know, people listen to experts like me 
Um, and I think I have good things to say, and I'm at a research-based institution. Given that, I'm talking about large numbers of children. You're talking about your own three boys. So, so no, but if you're feeling that maybe this is too much or, um, you know, the kids are getting a little spoiled, go with your gut because what might be feeding a sense of entitlement in your family might not at all in another family. So, uh, you know, I always want to make the caveat that uh, you are your children's best expert. Okay, given that, how do you tell if your kid's getting entitled? We all know when our kids are getting spoiled, they don't contribute, they don't seem to have much of a sense of purpose, they expect things, they don't, um, they, they, don't, they don't think it's their responsibility to pick up some slack. Uh, one of the healthiest, wealthy, wealthy families I know who has done a terrific job of raising their kids, those kids have um, a role in anything they want, as opposed to hmm. some families where the, you know, the kid says, I'm graduating high school, I want a Tesla or I want a uh, BMW. And they get it. And, and my argument would be they have no skin in the game. And so this family that I've worked with for years and they're wonderful, no kid gets a car until they've worked a job and can contribute whatever it is, one third, two thirds to the car. Um, and, and I've done that with my own children. Two of my three boys are lawyers. I paid for two years of law school uh, for both of them. And one year they paid on their own and I like this story. And they paid that third year on their own because my oldest son wanted to. And he came to me and he said, you know, education, it's like education is the most important thing I can give my kids. But my oldest kid said to me, Ma, I want to pay for the third year. I'll take out a loan. I want to have skin in the game. I've heard you talk about that my whole life. Let me do it. And frankly, it was hard for me because I'd much rather buy their education than a car or whatever. Um, but he was right. And the day, and so when my third son went to law school, that was the same deal. And the day my oldest finished paying off his loan, my youngest hasn't done that yet, was a huge celebration. And he felt great about the fact that um, this was partly owned by him. So I like the idea of chores. Kids have to have chores. Um, we want our kids to go out into a community, right? What's the first community? Your house is the first community. So they should have jobs. They should be responsible for them. One of the funny things I noticed when I'm going around the country is every child, this was pre-pandemic, every child in America knows how to get out of a chore. And that was, you know, you have dinner, and mom's worked all day, dad's worked all day. Mom says, okay, honey, load the dishwasher. And the girl or the boy says, oh, wait, no, I have my chem AP test tomorrow. And mom says, oh, never mind, I'll load it, you go study. Uh, wrong, because in the real world, first of all, you don't get to do that. And second of all, the three or five minutes it takes to load the dishwasher to be part of a community, to, to meet your responsibilities, to be counted on um, is far more important than the three minutes of um, studying. Dr. Levine, I could make this a three hour podcast because your book is extraordinary and your vice is so relevant. Let's get Thank practical you. in the last five or six minutes we have together. Um, as you look at the future of the economy, you write in your book, I think, and also in an article that I read, um, uh, and I think you said that close to 65% of all future jobs that our children will have aren't even invented yet. They're, they're not exactly you know, even knowable yet. So if that's true, that some large portion, perhaps even close to two thirds of the jobs that our children will be in aren't even yet in existence. What are the core skills that you think children being raised right now need to have to have successful happy, fulfilling lives? Okay, so uh, I'm gonna answer that with a story. Uh, I like stories. Um, I, about three years ago, I, or four years ago, I went with my son, my youngest son, uh, 
to get a new mortgage. And the, and the person I was talking to was the head of uh, the section of the bank that I was applying to. And she had her own business. She was kind of a big shot. And my son, Jeremy, who'd been a finance major, wanted to come along. And I said, fine. So he's maybe 20 at that time. No. So maybe it's seven years ago. He's maybe 20 at that time. And he's finishing school, but he's still in school. And my youngest son is like this really sweet, kind, thoughtful kid. Uh, so while I'm having this discussion about my mortgage, he notices the time and he says, hey, Ma, you know, I don't want you to get a ticket. Um, give me a couple quarters. I'll put it in the meter. So I do that. And that happens maybe twice in the two hours. My voice is always scratchy because I'm speaking so much. So at some point he said, hey, Ma, I noticed they had tea. Would you like me to get you some tea? I said, sure, that would help. And then he asked the woman, Carmen, who I was dealing with, did she want some tea? Um, anyway, we finished this hour of uh, discussion about my mortgage. She turns to my son and says to him, I would like to offer you a job. And it's like, what? <laughs> she doesn't know him. She doesn't know where he went to school. She doesn't know what kind of student he is, nothing. So I'm sort of like, what? Like, what made you do that? And she said, because he has great people skills and he's kind and compassionate. And that's the person I want sitting next to me at the bank. Um, long story short, he worked in the bank and hated banking so much that he ended up going to law school. But the, but the point of the story is that she was looking for an entirely different skill set. He wasn't a straight A student. He didn't go to um, an Ivy League school or anything like that. He was a good student at an average school. And my experience in talking to people, um, you know, I'm here near Silicon Valley at Facebook, at Google, at LinkedIn, is that people are looking for a different skill set. And that skill set is socio-emotional skills, it's collaboration, it's curiosity, it's resilience. You make a mistake, you get up right over again and try it again. Um, I, do I have two minutes? Oh, please. Oh, yes. <laughs> so I, I learned a tremendous amount. A friend of mine is a guy uh, who runs a... Um, uh, group of, of owners of businesses called Tugboat. And they're all young, very entrepreneurial. And he has me come in once in a while. And I have no idea what they're talking about half the time, but we were all on a team building exercise, which was a treasure hunt. And um, I contributed very little. But at some point, it was competitive. At some point, they decided we had the information we needed to win. And I'm like, no, you don't. You don't have all the information. You only have like 70% of the information. We still have to work. And they were like, no, nah, it's good enough. And if we're wrong, we'll just work harder and do more. That was a profound experience for me about the resilience of um, doing your best, not 100%. And I got the same thing, by the way, from uh, a lot of military leaders, which was, you're never going to have 100%. You have to iterate and reiterate and reiterate quickly. Um, and so I think that capacity is a really big one um, going forward. Do grades matter? Yes, it's nice to have grades. But look at what the Varsity Blues scandal. You know, that just exposed the craziness of what people think is inherent in a particular school. So my co-founder of Challenge Success went to Harvard and Stanford, and I went to the State University of New York at Buffalo and CSPP graduate school for my degree. And we're both on the stage and we're both getting paid the same amount of money and we're both equally knowledgeable. There is an overvaluation of particular schools and particular grades and an undervaluation of what we're gonna need going forward, curiosity, collaboration, people skills, um, resilience, the ability to get back up again, and enthusiasm about learning. Because if 65% of the jobs haven't been um, invented basically yet, you're gonna have to be really enthusiastic about learning and relearning and learning again. And I think those are the skills, all the attention we pay to the grades, we need to transfer that to the process 
to enthusiasm, to hands-on learning, by the way, which I think is a lot better than, especially you have three boys, I have three boys, sitting still for a whole day for young boys can be an incredible challenge. Um, and I, my own kids, well, two of my own kids did a lot better with more hands-on learning. So in their school, Redwood High School, we added a hands-on building engineering CAD um, program to the curriculum, but the, which I pushed, but they wouldn't give it credit showing that there was sort of a dismissal of engineering skills or they didn't see it as engineering, they saw it as building or shop um, over uh, you know, a standard academic course. I think, that's, I think that's a mistake. So those are some of the things that I think will be increasingly valuable. I think what you just shared is the reason why Franklin Covey's Leader in Me solution has been so explosive across the world in K-12 schools, because in essence, the Leader in Me is taking the principles of Dr. Covey's The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, things like collaboration, empathy, listening, planning, taking responsibility for your actions, prioritization, showing right. compassion for others. It's why these skills are so desperately needed in, in schools around the nation. Dr. Levine, in our last two minutes, I wanna ask you to address parenting in the pandemic. Uh, we're taping this interview in the first week of September. I'm not exactly sure when it will air, but for the most part, K-12 schools in the US at least have just started to be back in within the last you know, week or 10 days. Universities have been back in in the last you know, two or three weeks, and we're starting to see some concern, right? Universities shutting down, the pandemic right. beginning to explode, typically with out-of-class behavior, as opposed to right. in-class behavior, at least at the collegiate level. And I think every parent like me is on pins and needles, right? Will we just get another two weeks in school? Will we get another month in school before all hell breaks loose? We will hope right. for the best. Regardless of what happens with you know, virtual or live school, what practical advice as a psychologist will you give every parent in the nation that if our children are working from home for the coming weeks, months, year, how do we balance conflict resolution the iPad, the games, the phones, the TV, technology, technology. Winter is coming, right? In Utah, we won't be outdoors playing tennis two months from now. You know, a storm is coming. How do we prepare for this? So look, uh, you know, people keep asking me what are the best practices for right now? And the reality is there are no best practices because we've never had this before. And all the studies on, um, what do you do in, in difficult times or hurricanes or volcanoes? You know, they're, they're time limited. So I, I'd start by saying, look, it is an incredibly difficult time and everybody is having trouble with it um, and you should expect to have trouble with it. I have a very simple point of view about how to manage through this. And that is that nothing matters except getting through as a reasonably intact family. Um, I don't care about dusting or sweeping. I actually don't even care very much about how much your kid is on his iPad. I do care about the capacity of the family as a whole to maintain some integrity. And how do you do that? Uh, what we know is about kids and parents is that kids take their cue from you. The, the list of standard things uh, hasn't changed. Make sure you and your kids eat well. Make sure you and your kids exercise. Make sure you and your kids have some downtime. Uh, if, if you have kids who are so inclined, keep them connected to their peer group um, digitally, just like we're doing. Uh, keep yourself connected to your, your own support group digitally because we are so isolated and that is so difficult. Um, and have some fun if you can. Uh, I'm not interested, like I keep getting questions like, well, wake up time is nine o'clock and my teenage daughter won't get up till 930. And my answer to that is wake up time is now 930. That, what hill do you want to die on? And it's, it's not that half hour in the morning. So pick the things that are critical, get some structure in there. Um, and it's different at different ages. Young kids Less is more. People are telling young kids all kinds of, you know, we can't go to grandma because she has COPD and she might die. From, that's not for a four or five or a six year old. 
They need limited, calm information. I'd keep kids away from the media. Um, my original interest in life was in media. The, a guy named George Gerbner termed the coin Mean World Syndrome. The more media you watch, the worse you think the world is. The yeah. world's bad enough right now without making it feel worse. Um, so, and meditate and breathe. Do those things help? They do. And they seem so trivial in this time of great uh, distress. But I have several families, they all meditate at night together for 10 minutes before they go to sleep, they find it helpful. So I'm not, you know, for kids like yours or mine, or probably most of your audience, if they miss a few months um, of school, frankly, they will be okay because they have so many resources around them. The kids I'm really worried about are kids in under-resourced communities who don't really know how to use um, digital technology, who don't have parents who can stay home part of the time and help sure. them. Yeah. Those are the kids that are really, you know, the disparity we already have in education is just going to get greater. So, you know, keep your, keep your worry level about your kids at a reasonable level. They will, they will do okay. And how do you know when they're not doing okay? So if you have a kid who really seems incredibly anxious or won't get out of bed or doesn't do anything except be on their video games, call your pediatrician. You've seen three kids. I've seen three kids. Pediatricians seen 3,000 kids. It's a good first move. Um, you know, we don't diagnose anything till it's been going on for two weeks. So if you want another opinion about whether it's really a problem or not, um, I'd call it, start with a pediatrician, even before a mental health worker. But, you know, the simple things you can do are to eat well, sleep well, try and calm yourself down, you know, calm and anxiety are both contagious. Teach your child, you know, you, what you wanna do is you're going from the primitive part of your brain. Your brain is a prediction machine, right? That's the point of your brain. Imagine if you went through your day and you couldn't predict what time your show was on, when you had to interview somebody, when it would air, when you have to pick up your kids. You know that, that keeps your brain happy because you can predict things. So right now our brain is miserable. Um, we want to take it from the primitive part of the brain to the prefrontal cortex. And in order to do that, we need sleep and food and meditation and breathing and some area of self, you know, I'm, I'm tired of hearing like self care because I'm not sure what that means now. I think for a lot of women in particular, it means screaming in the bathroom, but <laughs> some part of the day where you're doing something that's nurturing, whether it's gardening or cooking or whatever. So that's my two cents on managing through this miserable time. Best line of the interview, calm and anxiety are both contagious. I will remember that tonight when my boys come home. Dr. Madeline Levine, your book is a gift. Ready or not, preparing our kids to thrive in an uncertain and rapidly changing world. Thank you for your generosity, your time, your abundance today. What's next for you? Uh, I'm like everybody else. Who knows? My book tour was canceled, right? Because we're in lockdown. Um, I'm increasingly interested in organizational work. And, and I think I've gone from treating one person at a time to writing books, which, um, you know, address hundreds of thousands of people because they were popular, to looking at um, even bigger structures, organizational structures around the issue of impact. You know, I like having impact on one person. I'd rather have impact on how school uh, meets the real needs of children. Well, the good news is I think your discussion today will have impact on literally millions of Franklin Covey subscribers around the world. So. Thank you again for your time. Highly recommend the book, Ready or Not, by Dr. Madeline Levine. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Scott. And thanks for joining us for another episode. If you're fun. not subscribing, please do so by visiting franklincovey.com. Click on the On Leadership tab, or you can also find us at all of your favorite podcast platforms. Rank us, review us, and invite all your friends and colleagues and family to subscribe to us as well. We'll see you back here next week for another interview on leadership.